Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, we're talking with Kai Sternstein, Vice President of the AMA's Advocacy Resource Center in Chicago, about a very important issue, scope of practice. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Kai, thanks so much for joining us again. The AMA has been addressing scope of practice at the state and federal level, uh, levels for over 30 years. Let's begin by getting a little bit of background on the issue and why it continues to be such a challenge. Sure. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, yes, 30 plus years, actually. And in fact, when I started the AMA 20 years ago, I cut my teeth on scope of practice as a young lawyer, analyzing laws across the country and proposed pieces of legislation and trying to figure out what was going on. You know, why are non-physician providers trying to get into the practice of medicine? Everybody goes to school for a specific purpose. Healthcare team is so critical in the delivery of healthcare, especially uh, today. We've seen that with the pandemic. And um, I think, you know, as physicians, um, you know, the education and training really matters, the level, the depth, the intensity, um, the time commitment. And, um, you know, physicians as a result are ready to be leaders of the healthcare team. And that doesn't mean that they do everything. It doesn't mean that they um, hold everybody tight. It just means that you need a leader, like you need a quarterback on a football team. And physicians are made for that. They're built for that. And so we're extremely passionate about this campaign, making sure that the practice of medicine is well-defined so that the patients that physicians treat are most protected. You mentioned the pandemic, and I think one of the uh, kind of surprises is that this this issue around scope of practice has become uh, even more so uh, during the past year and a half. Why is that? Indeed. Well, I think, you know, we've all been through quite um, an 18 months of something we'll never forget. And, and I think we all understood that in the height of the pandemic, uh, we needed an all hands on deck approach. Um, and as physicians uh, in the medical community and as leaders, we recognized that and embraced that concept. Um, we needed, and, and because our colleagues are so well respected, we knew the roles that they could play, the non-physician providers that, that provide healthcare in this country. And all of us rowing together in one direction was the recipe for success during the pandemic. But we also knew that um, by um, allowing for unprecedented um, activity and scope of practice during an emergency, that it would be likely that many of these non-physician provider groups would then take that and try to extrapolate it outside of the pandemic. And it's exactly what's happened. Uh, do you have any particular, you know, arenas where that is, uh, you know, the biggest kind of issue? Sure. I mean, we've seen this, um, you know, you had governors issue executive orders that allowed for things outside of state laws um, that defined what the scope of practice would be for, let's say, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Um, and um, so now, um, you know, we're, we're and not unexpectedly seeing things like Governor Baker in Massachusetts extending and making permanent his executive order, um, allowing for independent practice of nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nurses. Um, so expanding the law, taking it away from the legislature and unilaterally making that decision. Um, very, very frustrating because we liked the laws as they existed. We understood the emergency nature of the pandemic and why we needed the all hands on deck. But we so strongly believe in the team-based care approach to healthcare. So anytime you, you expand into independent practice and you take away collaboration and supervision um, and that role of the physician in the, the delivery of healthcare, we think that that's you know, siloing healthcare and is exactly the opposite of what not only um, we think is the uh, most high quality way to deliver healthcare, but it's also what patients expect and deserve. Kai, one of the arguments that we hear a lot by those that are pushing for scope expansion is that it will expand access to care. I'd like you to talk about why is that issue flawed? Um, that is a great question. And you know, it's one of the things I'm really proud of. So the AMA back in 2006 developed the scope of practice partnership. It's a 
collaboration of state and specialty societies and national medical specialty societies coming together, working collectively on scope of practice issues. One of the things we've been hearing anecdotally from physicians for years was that, you know, these non-physician providers are claiming that they're the solution to access to care, just expand our scope of practice, and we'll take care of the problems in the rural areas or in the inner cities. And we were hearing from physicians that it wasn't happening, that this was a failed promise, that this was a false premise. Um, we decided that we needed more than anecdotal evidence. So we un undertook an extremely comprehensive review, creating thousands and thousands of what we call geomaps that lay out the practice location of every single physician in the country um, down to the county level. Um, and then overlaying with that where the non-physician providers are actually practicing. So it's um, an incredible tool because you immediately visually see what is happening? And in states, for example, where scope has been expanded five, 10, 15 years now, guess what? The maps still look the same. Physicians and non-physicians are largely practicing in the exact same areas together. Um, and those, those promises of solving rural health care and access to health care, which is a huge and critically important issue, um, those issues remain. Those problems were not solved. Um, and so it's just incredibly frustrating, but we love this tool and it is extremely powerful with legislators, policymakers, and, and stakeholders around this issue. So that's a really p a big piece of uh, value that uh, the AMA brings to the table is that kind of data uh, yeah. that moves beyond the anecdotes that's right. uh, and really clarifies some of these arguments. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, how AMA addressed uh, other scope of practice challenges? Sure. I mean, in addition to this data set that we talked about, we've created modules that do deep dives into the education and training of all the major non-physician provider groups, not to denigrate um, their education training, because again, like I said, I, I think that, you know, physicians have deep respect and on the ground work hand in hand with their non-physician colleagues and understand that they cannot deliver medicine without them. But when you start hearing arguments in the legislature and the legislators coming back to us saying, um, you know, that somebody is claiming that their education and training is the same as physicians, that there's no difference. Um, we needed to call that on the carpet. And so we did a deep dive and started looking at um, the hours, the residency programs, all the um, coursework that physicians um, take and the training and the subspecialty uh, training that they undergo in order to be able to perform surgery on the eye or prescribe psychotropic medications to the most vulnerable patients. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, those were extremely valuable and are, are also at the heart of our scope of practice advocacy. And of course, none of this would be possible without the physicians on the ground, the advocates that can bring to the table their stories, um, the students and the residents when they come and speak to policymakers and legislators about their education and training and what it means uh, to them, the sacrifices that they've made um, the time spent, the type of training that they undergo in order to be able to perform a certain procedure or use a certain tool um, on the human body. I mean, I think that there's nothing more compelling and um, it's what uh, just, I think, is the heart of, of, our, of our scope um, campaign. And I know this obviously differs dramatically by specialty, but can you give any kind of detail on that? you know, the number of years that we're talking about in terms of yeah. education and training uh, versus, yeah, it's, you know, it's other... like over 10,000, right, hours, um, you know, it's performing, um, an anesthesiologist performing a specific procedure um, thousands of times to get that feeling that they need in order to be able to stand confidently alone. There's a reason uh, physicians go through the residency training and that kind of hands-on experience. And, and surprisingly, you know, many of these non-physician providers, um, they just don't have that kind of training. Um, and for good reason, because they 
don't perform or their education training doesn't prepare them to perform those procedures. Um, they have other roles, critical roles in the delivery of healthcare. Um, but you know, there's a reason why psychiatrists, for example, um, spend thousands and thousands of hours um, around prescribing and understanding what the, the impact of psychotropic medications are on the human body and, and understanding the totality of the human body. It's not just about that one prescription, that one drug. It's about all the other issues that are going on with the patient and bringing that whole piece together. And we just believe very strongly that it makes physicians unique and what they bring to the table is unique and valuable. And, 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 and I believe patients see that too. Our, our recent um, focus groups that we've done showcase that to us. Over 95% of patients strongly believe that physicians, uh, in order to deliver high quality care, physicians need to be involved in diagnosis. They need to be involved in the treatment of a patient. They expect it. They think it's happening. So it's our job to make sure that that is expectation is delivered upon. Now, if I understand this right, based on what you're saying, a lot of the activity around scope uh, uh, is happening at that state level. Can you speak a little bit more directly to how the AMA works then at that state level? Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, um, my team is the state advocacy team for the AMA, and we're a unit of eight attorneys. Uh, we are available 24-7 to work with our state and specialty society colleagues on this collective state advocacy agenda, which includes scope of practice. We review legislation real time um, and provide feedback. We create model bills and talking points and testimony. We prepare our trustees to testify. Um, we had Dr. Uh, Susan Bailey, our immediate past president, testify in South Dakota um, this year. And oftentimes the attorneys that work for me also testify when and, um, the technical expertise is needed um, by staff that really gets into the nitty gritty of the, the language and, and what the words actually mean. Um, this year, we work with uh, the vast majority of states that were in session on scope of practice legislation. We had um, significant victories, again, amazing work by state medical associations and specialties across the country coming together and making the case and winning. Um, we did suffer some losses as well, which, you know, is unfortunate. Well, to be expected, um, every state is different. Politics are local. And so, um, you know, without our um, collaborative uh, way and approach of working with states, we wouldn't have the success that we need. And again, the physicians that take the time to advocate on these issues, we wouldn't have the successes that we do year in and year out without them. It must be pretty difficult when you have that kind of scope expansion happening on 50 different fronts. <laughs> um, well, yes. speaking of uh, elevating physician voices and, and helping physicians advocate on behalf of the profession, talk a, a little bit about how you do that. How do you bring the physician, the leader that you're talking about, that voice to the front of these discussions about scope expansion? So critical. Well, first and foremost, we work hand in hand with the state and national medical specialty society. So through our scope of practice partnership, we have an ability and through our ambassador program here at the AMA um, and other incredible um, groupings of advocate physicians, um, we are able to activate physicians across the country um, to reach out to their legislators, to reach out to their policymakers, to be present at specific meetings. Again, this is all done in, in deep, deep coordination with the state medical associations. There are boots on the ground. They know when a hearing is critical and when a hearing is only for show. They know um, who needs to be spoken to, who's already made a decision, who's on the fence. So we are very strategic. We recognize physicians are incredibly busy. So we're not going to send people off on these wild goose chases. Um, you know, we are targeted in our approach. Um, we use social media to amplify our message. Um, and again, just tight, tight coordination with state medical associations. We couldn't do this work without them. Um, the national organization, you know, our perspective is really critical. Um, getting physicians and students and residents on the ground, rowing in the same direction with the same message. That only happens when we have this kind of relationship. And, and I'm really proud of that um, relationship that we have with the states. It's what keeps me coming back year in and year out um, on these issues. 
um, really challenging, like you said, across the country, red solutions, blue solutions, purple solutions, uh, but we're there. Um, every step of the way, whenever a state medical association needs us, oftentimes behind the scenes, so we don't get a lot of credit a lot of times for the work that we do, but you can bet if there's a scope bill that's moving, that's active, the AMA is there. The AMA is there. You mentioned some wins and some losses over the past you know, year or so as a result of the efforts. Any standout items you'd want to cover? Yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've had the classic situations that we expected. We have, you know, optometrists that are trying to uh, perform surgery on the eye. We have uh, physician assistants who are trying to replace physician supervision within their practice to um, collaboration, like continually kind of watering down the relationship between the physician and the physician assistant. Um, the same thing with nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nurses. Um, they've been at it for much longer. They are very active in completely trying to remove any supervision or collaborative agreements that exist. They are pushing for independent practice. Um, we see physician assistants trying to do the same. Um, we've had, like I said, many defeats. We've had, um, I mean, we've defeated many of these bills, most of them across the country. We have, um, however, seen, for example, when it comes to physician assistants, about five states or so where they move from supervision to collaboration. So this kind of like slow drip, drip, drip away from the collaborative team-based care approach. Um, it's very concerning. And, and then of course, there's the whole title misappropriation issue. Yeah, um, let's, that, let's talk Talk a yeah. little bit about that. Yeah. What, what's yeah. that mean? Yeah. So I'll tell you all about it. It's, it's, this is, this is something I could have never um, anticipated, you know, and, and I, and honestly just don't really understand why we're even spending time in this space. Um, you've got nurse anesthetists trying to be referred to as nurse anesthesiologists. Um, you know, we took that on in New Hampshire, huge collaborative effort with the State Medical Association and Specialty Society, um, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and we won in the New Hampshire Supreme Court where they uh, ruled, the court ruled that anyone using the term anesthesiologist um, must be licensed by the Board of Medicine. Um, you know, we have a whole truth and advertising campaign that's related to our scope work that talks about patients needing to know who is providing them their health care. Transparency, a light on who it is that's coming to them in in a, a exam room when you're like the most vulnerable that you could be in 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 a you know sitting in a gown waiting to be examined. It's important for you to know and be, be confident about who is providing you your healthcare. So wanting to be called a nurse anesthesiologist instead of a nurse anesthetist that's kind of um, flabbergasting to us. Also, the PAs are now in this game. Um, the physician assistants once were referred to as physician assistants, then they decided they wanted to be called PAs, and now they want to be called physician associates. This has all happened in probably the last four years, and um, they're you know ready to spend millions and millions of dollars on this name change. Uh, you know, I would just put out a challenge, perhaps that money could be spent on actually trying to figure out some of the problems that exist in healthcare. Let's put our heads together and talk about the access to care issues and figure out how we get healthcare to those most vulnerable um, that are in our rural areas or in our inner cities. Um, but while they're spending time there, we'll be fighting them all along the way because we have patients at the center of all of our thinking and know that we need to protect them and make sure that they are very clear on who is providing them their health care. Now, back in 2006, so this is a little over 15 years ago, the AMA formed uh, what's called the Scope of Practice Partnership. That's right. What exactly, what is the, the Scope of Practice Partnership? How's that work? It's awesome. Um, and um, I, I am proud to be one of the, you know, staffers that helped develop that in 2006. Um, it is our effort to focus medicine on a collective um, agenda when it comes to scope of practice, we focus on the legislative arena, the regulatory arena, the legal arena. We work really closely with the AMA's litigation center. Um, when there are issues in the courts, um, we kind of um, 
provide information and bring things back and forth between the two areas, um, but really um, love this collaboration. It speaks again to the need to collaborate, to be on the same page. We have about, um, I think a little over 105 medical associations as members of the scope of practice uh, partnership. We have a vibrant steering committee made up of 20 uh, state medical associations and national medical specialty societies. Um, we work with them really closely to deliver grants to states and specialties on scope of practice. Um, we have, um, and I'm proud to say, delivered millions of dollars worth of these grants to help states do the incredible work that they're doing on the ground to ensure that, you know, again, we protect those patients and um, protect what it means to practice medicine. So uh, as we head into uh, the end of this year, and hopefully a scenario where we can move beyond the pandemic in the coming year, what are you looking for in 2022 as kind of major challenges and opportunities in the scope of practice arena? Yeah, I think, you know, we expect just to be inundated again. Um, it's really challenging when you're um, dealing with um, and I hate calling um, these folks opponents because again, on the ground and where healthcare is delivered, they're teammates, but in the legislature, you know, we're dealing with an opposition that is singularly focused on scope of practice as leaders in healthcare, physicians and their medical associations focus on all the issues affecting healthcare. Um, it's not just about scope of practice. That's one of 50 plus campaigns that we all work on from telemedicine to access to care to um, uh, um, uh, just, I, I, there's just so many liability reform and Medicaid expansion and, and on and on and on it goes. So, you know, we expect um, all the providers to be back, that, to want more, to expand their scope of practice. And we're already working with states to align, to make sure our resources are aligned, that they have the tools that they need. Um, we um, are um, really excited um, to be in this space again, because we're the voice of the physician. Position. And um, we need um, we need those voices um, to be heard, loud and strong, uh, patient centered, high quality care, physician led team. Um, those are our messages. We have hundreds of resources. We've got everything ready to go. Uh, we are um, physicians' greatest ally when it comes to this issue. Um, we couldn't be more dedicated and enthusiastic about helping elevate physicians' voices and to remind policymakers, legislators, um, uh, stakeholders about the role of the physician and how important the physician is in the delivery of healthcare. Well, thanks so much, Kai. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about uh, the AMA's action activities in scope of practice, check out the AMA website to find those resources that Kai talked about. Uh, that's it for today's Moving Medicine episode. Uh, we'll be back with more shortly. Uh, in the meantime, click subscribe on our YouTube channel, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.